All right, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, we're really excited because February is our month celebrating women in science and exploration. Uh, in the middle of the month, there is the International Day for Women in Science, so we're spreading that out over all of February, over 35 hangouts with amazing women from around the world. So thank you for joining us today and being a part of that, and hopefully for the classes, you'll be joining us throughout the month. Right now, we have six classes from across North America involved. One more might be joining us in a bit, but I'll give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Mrs. Uh, we've got a group from Anaheim, California, over 60 kids from multiple classes. Hi guys. I like how that went up and then down like a cycle. Uh, all right, we've got Mr. Chitara, grade nine from Windsor, Ontario. Yeah, hi, they're just on lunch, they're not here yet. <laughs> they're coming, okay, awesome. We've got, we've got Miss Olson, grade five from Rochester, Minnesota. That is going to be tough to beat in pitch, if nothing else. Uh, we've got Miss Carton's grade fours in Anchorage, Alaska. They're coming in slowly but surely. Yeah. Yeah. There are few, but there are many. All right. We've got two other classes. We've got uh, Miss Nass's grade nines to twelves from Downington, Pennsylvania, Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Hey. Hey. Hi, guys. And then we have got, uh, just joining us, Mrs. Corneille's grade four from Solana Beach, California. Hi, guys. I like that there was like a hang loose thing to start that. That's awesome. All right. So the first the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We're joined by Kate Leeming, who's currently in San Diego, California, quite close to two of your groups. She is one of the world's foremost adventurers and explorers. She has cycled across Africa, cycled around Australia, cycled through Russia and Siberia, and she's plotting this massive expedition to cross the entirety of Antarctica and is keeping from being exhausted by cycling on all the other continents, which most of us cycle to the store or to school, but Kate, that's too little for her. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's it's a pleasure, Jesse, and it's wonderful to have everyone there from all over North America. It's quite exciting. The first thing I had to do was from Australia, and that was I was speaking at 1 o'clock in the morning, so it's nice to be speaking at 10 o'clock in the morning. Anyway, I'm going to launch into my uh, program because otherwise we won't get through it, and I've got lots of pretty good photographs to show you so and some videos as well. So I'm going to go into screen share. Then I'm going to go entire screen and share. Let's just hope this does what I want it to do. Can you see the everything? How's that? Uh, not quite yet. We see one of the. Oh, there we go. Now you're good. 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 Off we go. So I like to uh, brand my expeditions. It's called Breaking the Cycle. Um, and I. Got to give you a little bit about my story and how it all came together. So, um, first of all, I guess I started, everyone, as Jesse said, likes to cycle, you know, maybe to the shop or to school. And that's kind of, you know, I just used to cycle for pleasure. Then how did I go from that to now where I've done about, you know, uh, 50,000 50, miles around the world. So it's like twice around the world at the equator on my major expeditions. So, um, and obviously not always that easy. So this was, that was going across the middle of uh, Western Australia, where there was about 360, so 250 miles of that kind of stuff. And I was carrying about 50 uh, kilos on, on my bike as well. So it was pretty hard work. Um, a lot of people used to think, oh, she must be mad doing all of this kind of thing. But actually, I used to get a bit annoyed when people used to say mad because it was a bit like saying, um, oh, you know, it was discrediting what I do, but now I like to think about the positives. And so I think of MAD as standing for making a difference, which is what I try and do with each of my expeditions. So I guess I started to travel by bicycle, didn't know what I could do. And then I went across to Europe um, and I was playing some field hockey. And then after that, I did a little trip in Ireland. And then little trips led to bigger trips. And over the space of the next, uh, let's think about uh, two years, I did about 15,000 kilometers or 9,000 miles through Europe. And that was just my exploration. 
so um, from that, I just that's just really where I found my passion. So I guess the reasons why I like to travel by bike, because um, it just gives a great connection with the people in the land. And I really love the idea of bringing a line on a map to life. And I find that traveling on a bike gives a great sense of place, like a perspective of how the world fits together. And so when you join in with hopefully following my expeditions throughout this year, I'm sort of trying to encourage you to be able to explore and to see how the world fits together yourselves as well. Uh, I was just traveling for myself and learning. And then I met a fellow called Robert Swan who inspired me very much. He was a polar explorer, the first person to have walked to both the North and South Poles. And so Robert explained that there's a lot more that I could do with, with this skill I had of, of riding my bike. And so the next year I planned the Trans-Siberian Cycle Expedition. And that was uh, 8,304 miles across Russia. It was the first time a woman had cycled all the way from St. Petersburg in the West near Europe, in Europe, to Vladivostok, which is near Japan uh, in the East on the Pacific Ocean. And this is just a photograph of us arriving at the finish because we were absolutely ecstatic. We had arrived one day ahead of schedule after five months. And that was really about sticking to the goals. And there was lots of things that we had to adapt to. I'd broken a rib on the step and we had to get through this swamp where there was a thousand miles where there was just no roads marked on our, on our maps. So we had to follow the railway line. So there was lots of things. The country was in quite a lot of chaos. So to get to the finish, we were really excited. In fact, all of my country, all of my expeditions have been finished on time and on budget and with really no major injuries. Uh, especially this one in Australia that was 25,000 kilometres and I, I keep going back to miles, I'm not quite, I get a bit confused, it's about 17,000 miles I think. A lot of that was off, all that red, uh, all those red lines on the map are actually off-road so you can see it's quite, quite, a, um, quite a tough trip. And so what I wanted to share with you is the process that I did have to go through from actually creating the idea, creating the vision, how much it takes to organise it, actually executing the expedition and then what has to happen afterwards to document it and analyse it and, and finally create something else. So this is the process I've been going through and it seems to work pretty well. And so during my um, Australian journey I had this idea about cycling across Africa and uh, you know, in, I guess in the past I was a little bit wary about cycling across Africa because there's lots of negative stories coming out and you know it's a dangerous place and that kind of thing. But I really wanted to, to give it a go. I knew other people cycled there. And so I looked at um, maps of Africa and I could see there was um, um, a lot of countries, especially going across from west to east, that had issues about education and they needed to improve their education. So that was one of my, the reasons why I wanted to travel across Africa to create the story and understand about some of the problems. So it wasn't just Africa, actually education. In the end, I chose to um, uh, sort of learn about the cause, learn about all the causes and effects of extreme poverty and specifically what's being done to give a leg up rather than a handout. So the positives and kind of find out what all the good things that are happening in Africa. And uh, so it took about 18 months to put all that together. That nearly killed me. Um, just I had to find 30 different sponsors. I had to sell the idea to lots of people. Um, I had to find teammates who wanted to film it. So all these things, not just about getting on a bike, there was so much extra to put into it. And that's a lot of expeditions don't even make it to the start point for that reason. So, um, yeah, that was really tough. But in the end, I got there with the team. And this is me at the very start of that expedition. Very excited, actually quite exhausted, but really excited to be there at the start of that expedition. And with all this big adventure ahead of me, 10 months ahead of me, cycling through 20 different countries. So off we went. Now the team, because I wanted to um, film it, usually I travel unsupported, carrying all my bags. But, but uh, here um, I had a team, I had a, Daniel who started cycling with me. And I guess the main person that was really important here was the guy next to me in the middle, John, because he was uh, coordinating all the vehicle support. So it doesn't matter how good a cyclist myself was, uh, if, if the vehicle broke down, then uh, you know, we had to work as a team, even though we were doing different things. So we set off and very quickly we we're into the most diverse continent on earth culturally and so, so much difference in landscapes and people. It was incredible. So this was crossing uh, the border between Mauritania and Mali, a remote border, and we're just following little tracks. 
And I mean, these people hadn't even seen a bicycle before. So you can imagine what I must have looked like, some sort of alien from outer space, I would have thought. And then, like we were sitting under a baobab tree and having money, our own business and having lunch and these beautiful nomads came past, the Fulani nomads and just these, these women. And they were really intrigued by us. Obviously, we looked a bit different. And the girls were initially a little bit worried about um, my friends, my colleagues who are all men. But when I got up, they didn't seem to be worried. So I went and got my camera out of my bag and I took a snap of Daniel just to show my, my colleague, just to show them you know, the back of the camera. And they really just absolutely said, you know, pick me, pick me. I'd like to have my photo taken. So I got all these beautiful photographs. And it was an incredible exchange between myself and, and a very different culture. And then again, up in, uh, this is in the middle of Africa in Cameroon, up in the mountains on the border between Cameroon and uh, Nigeria. And we met uh, some of the Koma people and they're a very different group of people. Again, they almost live in a kind of a stone age culture. They don't, you know, they um, often just get out and wear leaves. So the, the women might go and pick leaves and wear them. That's, their, that's what they wear just around their waist. And um, uh, there's only about 3000 Koma left, but here, I was sharing a little interaction, I guess, with this grandmother. And I mean, I'm eating little wild figs there, just little figs, and they'll taste beautiful, actually. So, um, so that was just, there's lots of different exchanges with different cultures. Now, traveling through Africa, I, even though I would love to stay with the people all the time, I had to keep moving because I had a time limit. I had to time the whole um, expedition to fit in with the seasons to go along the base of the Sahara Desert. Uh, when it's cooler and then to, we had to cross the equator twice so there was lots of different things so I had to stick to a, a pretty um, good schedule so I was doing about 130 kilometers a day which is about 80 miles a day give or take um, that's kind of on average yes we'd have days off but I had to really be quite disciplined to stick to that whatever the situation so whether it was um, you know it fell off hurt myself it's only really skid here, but it was a bit of a nasty fall. So we just had to keep going no matter what. Um, mud, lots of mud in the Gabon and the Republic of Congo. The roads weren't too good there. But, um, you know, six, six to eight hours a day is what I tend to, to cover. And then a lot of people ask me, you know, um, did you ever want to give up? And it's a very common question. And the answer probably you know, for me is absolutely not. You know, I had some tough times. But I guess what's really important is if you really are sure about what you want to do and why you want to do it, so sure of your mission. And in this case, I had a, an education program running. I had kids following, especially from Australia. I had, uh, you know, 30 different sponsors. I had all sorts of people following what I was doing. So um, if you put that in perspective, that really keeps me going. So hopefully what I'm doing in my expeditions this year, I know you guys will be, be following, and uh, that will really help me, motivate me to keep me going through these situations. But then I have lots of mental techniques as well to, to get through. So about a quarter of the way into the African expedition, I've done about 5,000, 5,500 kilometers. Um, so I've done quite a long way, but I still had 17,000 to go. And I'd been sick three times. I had a chest infection. I was going into the wind and there was lots of sand in the air. And I was really, really low. But you know, I thought of all those things and then you have to think of, you know, how amazing is it going to be to get to the finish, to get across the Somali plains and think about all those things ahead of me that I really am looking forward to explore. And then I'd work back all the way back to, um, you know, that month, that week, the next town, uh, that get through that next session, the next hour, and I'd break it right down to, to just getting to the top of the next hill, right down to just getting past the next post or the next tree. And what, I guess, is really amazing for me is to if you you can be really negative but if you actually think about the positives and think about looking for the beauty in your surroundings so this example like in the sahara desert the sahara desert could be a really horrible place or you can imagine that as being really beautiful if you think of it as being really beautiful you'll really will you will get through so you've always got to be able to think of those positives now i was looking at all different uh, types of active um projects during the journey. I visited 15 different projects, whether they're to do with education or other issues relating to extreme poverty, whether it's health issues, um, uh, industry, agriculture, all sorts of things. 
but I wanted to show you a little bit about just, just one project. And in Burkina Faso, you know, girls don't get the same kind of um, opportunities as boys for education. So I was looking at that. And what I learned was it's not just about creating the buildings or helping in that way. It was more about educating the local people, the leaders, that they understood that if, if girls got educated, their communities would be much better off because the girls could earn more, um, they would have healthier families and probably a, a smaller number of children. And um, uh, yeah, so everyone would be healthier and better off. So um, once the leaders understood that, then basically, like in this situation, the girls and the boys were, were equally going to school and all achieving. And so hopefully, you know, like you, you know, they'll be tomorrow's leaders. So it's really important to get them all having a chance at education, just like you. And then going across, now I'm just switching right across to the other side of Africa. Um, this is the stony deserts in North Kenya. And that was pretty tough, tough going. It's about 400 kilometers of those stony deserts. Uh, then into Ethiopia. I'm going to switch right across to the other side into Somalia. And in Hargeisa, which is um, the major city of a, of a part of Somalia called Somaliland, and I visited uh, a school for the deaf. Now, normally, if people had a disability in a place like that, there would be no chance of them getting any education at all. But uh, these girls were really loving learning, and we were communicating on the blackboard, and um, it was it was quite an incredible time. Um, and actually, what they're saying there, that that sort of funny, their little showing you pause. That's actually the Australian, sorry, Somali sign language for Australia. So. Um, they were having a bit of a joke there, but it was true, it really was. Now, a little mini geography lesson about Somalia. So you, you kind of have to think of it as three different countries. You've got sort of um, Somaliland, like you see Hargeisa there, and that's kind of pretty stable. That was formerly British Somalia. And then you've got Southern Somalia. I can't put, do a pointer right now, but um, sort of the, the bottom part of that is where the capital, uh, Mogadishu is. And then the brown is, is Puntland which is like a state, it's like the state of California or state of Alaska or whatever. Um, so basically what I had to do was get, I go this, follow the main route. We didn't really want to go into Southern Somalia because if you see all that green stuff, that was being controlled by extremists called Al-Shabaab and we really didn't want to have to, like that's dangerous. So we had, I had the support of the governments of Somaliland and Puntland and they provided lots of security all the way through. And they were getting, especially you see up that little bit of green at the top between Kado and Busaso, that was a conflict zone where the, there was actually a war going on. They're just trying to blast out the extremists there. So we had to go near that. So we had to kind of go undercover. So it's through Somaliland, through this buffer zone, which was a little bit tricky because that Somaliland and Putland don't get on. And then last 700 kilometers out to Hafun, which is the most easterly tip of Africa. So a little bit of a trip here. So we're just taking you through Puntland. The president himself loaned us his very own soldiers to support us. We traveled with the soldiers and two bulletproof vehicles, which my cameraman and my sister, who was with us at the time, uh, traveled in as well, and, and a couple of uh, government ministers. So it's kind of an unusual type of cycle trip, this bit. And then uh, heading across the, the plains at the finish, last 400 kilometers, getting starting to get quite excited. Um, arriving, this is the Hafud Peninsula, almost to the easterly tip. We just had to go up onto that mountain there and across to the finish. Uh, and this was pretty exciting because it was a massive thing. We arrived there four days ahead of schedule after 10 months. And it was a whole team effort, even though it was me, the only one cycling all the way. We had all sorts of people with us. So I was pretty ecstatic. Uh, and yeah, it really, really worked. It took another four years to put together um, uh, the, the write a book and put a film together. I'm just going to show you the film, a little trailer for it. So hopefully this will come through okay um, on your on your uh, screens. This was a journey like no other, a world first achievement. For me, it was a quest for knowledge and understanding. I read 22,000 kilometers over 10 months across 20 African countries facing just about every condition under the sun. My name is Kate Leeming. I'm a sports professional, an adventurer, and an explorer. On this ride, I had to confront the realities of some of the poorest people on earth. I'd like to take you on that journey to witness these challenges, 
but also be uplifted by the spirit and the astonishing natural beauty which is Africa. Well, I guess I love to travel and see parts of the world by cycling, and there's no better way of seeing a country and get just an incredible connection with the people in the land. We're going along at a quite a steady pace now, 22, 23 k's an hour. Try and do a big day today, 130 k's, 135 k's. If we keep going at this pace, we'll be just continuously cycling for about another five hours. 40 degrees every day, seriously hot, and my body wasn't quite up to condition, so I was struggling physically for a while there. I can't keep any food in my system, so I've got to keep drinking. So much for shortcuts. Oh, yeah. So you feel? Yeah. I'll show you the injuries. They're pretty ugly at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. This fellow here has just been sharing the shade with us, and while he's been sitting here, he's just made this break. And it's simply just made out of palm fronds from the local trees here. I'm also very passionate about education and the importance of education in this world. We'll be able to teach family planning, we'll be able to teach all sorts of things, mm -hmm. which will work towards safe motherhood. Maybe with time, things can change. So the rebels attacked them, they took their cattle away, they took all their property, they killed their husbands and their children. This is an adventure which hopefully you'll be inspired to learn more about Africa. It is about the causes and consequences of extreme poverty, but in particular the positives and what's being done to give a leg up rather than a hand up. So we get through all of that and get through to, to the finish and everything's successful. So what is there left to do but after documenting everything is to create a new vision. And I'm going to run through this fairly quickly, but this is what I'm up to now, breaking the cycle South Pole. And I guess, you know, I was always intrigued by Antarctica, but never before would have been possible to even think about cycling across it. And then there was lots of, you know, different developments in um, technology and um you know, people that tried cycling, and I just thought it was really possible. So I, coming from Australia, it's a bit like San Diego here, it's pretty warm. So I'm not very good at the cold climates. And so I had to learn how to get all the different skills uh, to manage in the extreme cold and exercise in the extreme cold. And one of the first things I did was obviously try to research uh, making the bike. And I ended up coming to North America and um, found this fellow called Steve Christini who made an all-wheel drive bicycle. There's lots of information on my websites about that, but it basically it means that when the back wheel slips, the front wheel grabs and it gives me a lot more grip, a little bit more like a four wheel drive uh, vehicle does. It doesn't make me go faster or anything, but it's, I thought in the snow, when the surfaces are very soft, 
you need to have um, having the front wheel drive as well as the back and obviously having big fat tires for flotation over the snow uh, is, is really important. So I'm just going to talk through this a little bit and basically I got together with a, a polar explorer called Eric Phillips and a, um, a, a team, a, a, a Claudio von Planter, who's a really great filmmaker. And we went up to Svalbard, which is a Norwegian islands, like level with the top of Greenland, so 80 degrees north. And we tested out all of this equipment uh, in the extreme cold. And it was really cold. It got down to about minus 30 Celsius at one point. So that was a massive challenge. And from that expedition, uh, we worked out that pretty much this is possible. We need to, needed to uh, develop some of the clothing and equipment much more. And obviously the main thing is to try and find the funding as well. So um, just quickly went through there. I'm just going to move you on. Uh, Northeast Greenland I did a couple of years ago. And again, testing more equipment. Let's take you through those here, passing polar bear tracks. Obviously we need to be careful with what's around with polar bears and so on and so forth, having taking all the precautions. And you can see how hard I'm working, just going up a slight slope, even though the snow looks relatively firm. On a bike, that's pretty tough going. And those those tires are almost five inches wide. Uh, Greenland was melting quite a lot at that time, a little bit earlier than we'd hoped. So it meant that the conditions weren't quite what we needed. Um, everything got a bit slushy towards the end, but it was an incredible ex learning expedition. And then last year, uh, I went to uh, the Canadian Arctic up to the Yukon and Northwest Territory to the to the um, top of the Mackenzie River Delta and did a, a lovely expedition there. Again, that was really was cold. So this is us going up towards Shingle Point, um, long channels over the boat at sea out to Shingle Point. That's normally four and a half hours on a boat journey for the fishermen. So it was kind of, um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty amazing journey out there. And we learned a lot. It's basically ready for Antarctica, but didn't quite get the funding. So this is the plan this year. And this is what I'd like to be able to, you to be able to share in this journey with me. So, so it's, I've got sort of, I'm much more likely to find the funding at the end of this year. We've got a lot more support than I have had, ever had before. We haven't got it all yet for Antarctica. But what I plan to do this year is do a, a preparatory expedition on every continent. So you can see the Baja Peninsula, which I'm about to start tomorrow, actually. And then Iceland, that's straight after that. And then there's two expeditions in sand, because cycling in sand is similar to cycling in snow. So it's great for strength work. I've got one in Australia uh, in the, along the Fink River, and, uh, which is just this, a dry riverbed. And one in uh, Namibia along the Skeleton Coast. Uh, then two altitude training sessions, one in La Paz, from La Paz to Uturunku in Bolivia, and the other in the Indian Himalaya. So just that's what I'm about to start tomorrow, um, down the Baja Peninsula, a good way to get into this and get back into uh, expedition mode, because it's quite different, the mentality that you need for that. And then straight on, to, um, straight on to Iceland after that. So you'll be able to follow those, and then later on, I hope, won't show you them all now, but basically, the final journey uh, is across Antarctica. We need to be able to cross the continent, um, technically just land, but I'd like to start, if I can, from McMurdo Sound uh, out and go over the, over the Ross Ice Shelf, up on up Leverett Glacier to the South Pole and then down to Hercules Inlet. So that's, that's the idea. And this is how I always like to finish my talk. So if you are dedicated, realistic, and enthusiastic towards your goals, show a positive, positive attitude, then you will achieve your mission. So if you can write that down or ask us there, so dedicate, dream, dedicated, realistic, enthusiastic towards your goals, show a positive attitude, and then you can achieve your mission. And then this is what we'll be doing. We'll be connecting with kids around the world, uh, students, there's lots of activities on my new website, which launched this morning. Um, and we'd love teachers to get involved and be able to register their classes so we can we have a lovely world map in there so we can see where you are and uh, check out some of the resources that we're it's only just starting it's going to be developing over the next few months but um, it's certainly a way that you'll be able to follow everything so that is my story and I guess now it's time for a few questions um, out, out. Out's so I had to get through that. Normally I put that talk into about 40 minutes, so I had to quickly go through it. So we'll stop sharing and back to...
Right screen. Hang on, let me get back to the right screen. Yeah, you're there. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, so just for those classes too, I've sent that website to every single class in your email address, in your inbox, so you can check it out there. There's education resources. There's tons of great stuff. We'll also be updating throughout the year Kate's expedition, so you can follow them. Uh, but for now, as she said, let's do our Q&A session. We will start in Anaheim. So if you guys have a question, come on up. Oh, yeah. yeah, we have one. Okay. I think. Take your time. Come on up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hi, my name is Kevin. Um, I have a question. What kind of nutrition do you need on the way to your um uh, adventures? Yeah, well, Kevin, it depends where I am. Um, it's a good question, though, because obviously eating is pretty important here to get enough energy and to be able to maintain my health, especially when I'm going for a long period of time. So um, I guess I need lots of uh, energy food before I start cycling, and during the day I have to graze on lots of things, lots of bars or um, pro like fruit and nuts and lot, you know things that are easy to eat. And then um, the breakfast would be kind of things like porridge or, or high energy, lot, again, lots of things that have long-lasting energy. Um, uh, obviously, drinking a lot of water and fluids. Sometimes I like to have cups of tea, too, because that helps boost the morale. And then at night, you know, I also eat quite a lot of protein, because obviously you need protein to be able to, um, uh, to recover properly. So protein is really important. And in the cold, fat and oil is pretty important, because that that's keeps you the warmest. So I've got to have a balance of all of those things. Um, you know, in Africa, it's a little bit different because we had a vehicle that we could buy some things during the journey and we'll keep them in the vehicle. So it was easier to control that kind of thing. But obviously down in Antarctica, we have to be really well planned, you know, way ahead of time because we just can't pop down to the shop to get something we've forgotten. So we have to make sure we have everything with us. I'm on this trip in the Baja. We'll it's bike packing, so we can't carry that much. So we have to carry a little bit of food, and we have to know where the next place is that we can get food. So sometimes we might be carrying, you know, a couple of days worth of food with us, and plus fuel to cook the food, all that kind of thing. So there's a lot of planning, and we have to carry lots of extra water to places. So we've got bottles, and then we've got water bags. So it's complex, but you have to have the right system for the right place. Outstanding, great answer. Uh, all right, let's go to Mr. Chitaro's class. Yeah. So, so we can see on the screen there, just as close as you can to the video. Um, hi, my name is Sam. Um, my question is, how much money did it, the overall trip through Africa cost? Africa? Um, well, the biggest cost, Jen, was um, actually I had to pay the support vehicle driver. So... Um, in Australian dollars, I'll have to convert back. It was about the whole value of absolutely everything is about two hundred thousand. So about um, in US dollars, that makes it about uh, one hundred and fifty thousand Canadian dollars, somewhere in between that. Um, that's a lot of money. So, and I didn't have a major major sponsors. I had thirty different ones, so I had to rely on lots of people giving smaller amounts, and and that's what's holding me back with Antarctica is because. Small, a lot of smaller amounts helps a bit to do these smaller expeditions, but I need a little bit more, um, especially the um, funding. But if I can get equipment, like like if we have the support vehicle and things, they're some of the main costs. A cycling bit's not very expensive, but but things like running an education program, they're extra expenses. So you know I have to build the websites and all that sort of thing. But that's really important because otherwise I can't communicate. So there's 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 lots of costs, not just doing it but everything around it and then I guess you also have to consider that I can't work during that time so I can't earn any money so you know get back I've got no money then I've got to kind of find a think of a way of surviving so it's not just the, the straight dollars um it's it's every it's it's a massive commitment all around all around of that so it takes all every bit of that dedication and your your dream uh anagram so that's uh good for you that's quite that Expedition. All right, let's go to Miss Olson's class. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's a noisy one. Hello. 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 
Did your legs ever feel numb when you were riding your bike? Um, probably just not my legs feeling numb. There are other parts that were probably feeling numb too, like backside, <laughs> sitting on that bike seat. Um, sometimes at the very end of very long, really long days, it's like you're going around like a legs are going around like you're a robot. But um, I guess the most important thing is to be able to also stop and have rest and let recover a little bit. And so I'd cycle for about usually in the mornings between you know two to two and a half hours. Then I'd stop and have a break and uh, eat something, and then go again for about one and a half hours, and then one and a half hours, and then one and a half hours. So I kind of break it up so that I try and reduce the numbness. But in the cold, the hardest thing is to stop the the feet, especially feeling numb, because not just the cold, because when you cycle. Um, you push a little bit of blood out of the balls of your feet. So if that's in a, in a cold situation, even though I have very good boots and things, uh, still, you know, that, that's kind of an issue that I have to really be very careful with. I want to keep my fingers and toes. That's important, especially if once you're done Antarctica, you want to go elsewhere, which I'm sure you yeah, will. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, let's go to Anchorage uh, for Miss Curtin's class. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, he's coming on up. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Sai, and my question is, what inspired you to start biking in, on really, really, really long trips? And will you come to, a, will you bike around Alaska someday? Oh, look, I really wanted to bike around Alaska last year, but it just worked out that I went to the Yukon instead. But I was, I was nearly in Alaska last year. Because um, uh, there's the Iditarod Rod Trail there, that's pretty uh, pretty amazing for biking. Um, what inspired me overall? Well, I started off, I didn't know what I could do, so I did little trips. Like I quite enjoyed cycling, but I was a, an athlete. I play a lot of other sports, and then I just understood how I could, what I could do when I started cycling through Europe. So I just wanted to travel, and and then. Then once I started to understand what I could do, then I realized actually I can do quite a lot with this. So it started off being, you know, a small trip, you know, five days in Ireland. And then I did a, a six weeks through France and Spain. And then I came back the next year and started in Spain and went all the way to the Mediterranean and back from the UK. So it kind of got bigger and bigger as I got more adventurous and decided to do a lot more with the journey. So that's how they become these big epic trips. It didn't just start from scratch. It, it evolved. So that's what I'm saying to you, though. If you start with something and you try it, and then you work out what your passion is, then you can uh, maybe you can work out how you can do, start with something small and you try it, and then you, you think, oh, that's good. I can, I can make that a bit bigger and a bit more effective, and then you keep building on that. And that's how I started. And maybe you have a different passion. Outstanding. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to Mrs. Nass's class. Uh, you guys have to demute your own mic, though. So if you guys want to come on up, just have to go to the top of the screen and little microphone symbol and uh, go from there. There, there we you go. Go ahead. Um, when you were in Africa and like when you had to communicate with all the different people, how did you overcome those language barriers? Like, did you have a translator that went with you or? Well, I'm pretty poor and then I, I really only speak English fluently. And so the first half of that journey, um, obviously that, People have their own languages, but also mostly they would speak French. And I know some words in French, but I don't have conversational French, for example. So that becomes much more difficult. Uh, so there are ways we can manage. And in certain places I had, um, a, like in Mauritania, I had a fixer. So he spoke Arabic, French and English. Um, and so that helped us get through. So usually when there was a place that we needed some help with, especially security, we would have I employed someone to stay with us for you know, whatever it was and would learn more that way. Um, obviously, the second half of Africa, most of it's English speaking as well as, so that made it easier. Um, so because of the colonial effects on Africa, actually, the language becomes a little easier. We, we don't have to speak, you know, you can speak English, French, and it's, I mean, in Angola, it's Portuguese, but, but you, you know, so we, it is difficult, but but um, 
actually traveling by bike you break down barriers quite well so people put you out in the open and you can com communicate in, in other ways and smile nicely the right time if you really can't speak and lots of lots of uh, gestures and so on so so yeah it's, it's not easy i'm going to skip down the bar peninsula i don't speak uh spanish so um i'm sure there'll be some english speakers there but uh we'll have to learn a few more words between now and tomorrow and if you have any leftover tea for boosting your own morale you can share it which is good That's too right. absolutely yeah. all right so let's go to uh, who haven't we hit yet? We haven't met Miss Corneille's class. If you guys could demute your own mic, that would be great. And then you can come on up. Yeah, take your time, guys. Sorry for the trouble. I wish I could do it from here. It's just, yeah, top of your screen and this little microphone symbol. Thank you. There, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Have you cycled? from west border to east border of every continent? No, but maybe by the time I'm finished, I might have. <laughs> so think about it, I've done through Europe and then I've done all the way across Asia because obviously Russia from all of Siberia is Asian Russia. Then Australia, well, I've done more than that. I've been to the most northerly, southerly, easterly and westerly points and all a bit in the middle. You think Australia is about the same size as mainland USA. so. It's a pretty big journey, 25,000 Ks. Um, uh, Africa, obviously, the most westerly, the most easterly tip. Antarctica, that's what we're aiming at across the continent. And I have North America to cover, don't I, and South America to cover yet after that. Coming up soon, by mid-2020s, you'll have it done. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <All right. laughs> We've got a question from a class in Paris, Ontario online, which is how long do you think it's going to take to cross Antarctica? Um, well, I think around about two months. It depends on um, which route. So whether I do the smallest version, which is 1,800 kilometers, which is 1,200 miles, um, that's just the land bit from Leverett Glacier up to the South Pole and down the other side. Um, I think I can probably do about minimum of 40 kilometers a day. Uh, you know, if I'm having a good day, you know, it could get up to, you know, 50 or a bit more. Um, so, yeah, at the moment I'm saying 62 days. Um, across the um, ice shelf, it's obviously, it's flatter, but sometimes the snow can be softer. So we're aiming, I'm aiming to follow the, um, there's a, a traverse, the, the American uh, bases between the McMurdo Sound and the South Pole to a traverse, like an overland traverse three times a year with heavy vehicles. So they, they have a route, which that's what I'd be planning to follow. Um, so it still could be soft, it still be hard. I'm not, you know, but, but that makes it potentially more manageable. Um, and, and, you know, if I could do 60 kilometers a day, it's a bit more manageable, that would be good. But that's why I'm doing all the testing as well. But, um, you know, at the moment I'm thinking two months. Excellent. Uh, all right, so I know that it, sometimes when it gets to be the 45 minute mark, it's tricky for some classes and they have to go. So if there's a, we'll do a few more questions, guys, and then, uh, then we'll wrap it up. So we'll go back to Mr. Chitaro's class for now. You guys have a second question? Yeah. Oh, wait, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Oh. <laughs> How much physical preparation did it take for you in order for you to be ready for Africa? Um... Well, I always plan to be really fit by the time I start these things, but putting it all together is an absolute nightmare. So I have a lot of um, uh, strength and inbuilt, like I know what I can do. Um, but then, you know, leading up to it, it's kind of like anti-training because, you know, I'm, I'm working around the clock pretty much trying to coordinate everything and traveling. So actually when I started that African journey, I was, I was exhausted. <laughs> so... So, you know, sure, I've tested because I have an injury, a knee injury that I have to manage that I've had for about 20 years. So it's, it's not a perfect world, but um, I have to make sure that before I commit to doing these journeys that my body's in good health and that my knee can cope with it. And I have to have a plan the whole way through. But I'm not racing, so I can go at my own pace. So when I start off, you know, the first few days are pretty hard. Um, but then, you know, I have a rest and I'll recover a little bit and get a bit stronger. And then, you know, a couple of weeks into it, I'm pretty good. Uh, I started off in Africa. The first day was 
110 kilometers. The second day was about 105, but I was really struggling on the second day because of the heat as well. You know, it was it was it was 100 degrees or 37 degrees, but really humid, and I was carrying weight, and it was just just very tough. But but then I recovered, and, and basically after that, I was I was pretty good. Excellent. All right, we've had to have two classes drop out actually. So what we're going to do is at the end of every hangout. We have all the classes joined together and saying a big thank you. So Mr. Chitaro's class, Ms. Olson, Ms. Curtin, Ms. Nass, if you guys can join me in saying a huge thank you to Kate for joining us today. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> awesome. Uh, if you guys have more questions too, so whether it's Kate's personal website or the Education Breaking the Cycle website, you guys can ask questions there and learn more. Uh, we'll also, as I said, be updating you guys with our expedition as she continues uh, first in Baja tomorrow and then around the rest of the world. And Kate, thank you so much for joining us. That was wonderful. It's a pleasure. It's always good to talk with you guys. It's all good. So make sure that the teachers also to register on my site so we can have some lights around in North America. That makes sense. There's a, there's a, a map. Um, and, and there's a little tiny form, you just have to say that, and then we're, because it's brand new, we don't have anyone on there yet, so we'd love you to lead it and, 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 and be a good example if you can. Awesome. Uh, it would appear that a class wants to take a picture with you, so what we're going to do is we'll stop the broadcast in a minute, and then we'll, we'll stay behind so you guys can do that. That's awesome. Uh, cool. So thanks guys for joining us for the rest of the classes. If you want to stay around for the rest of the month and just check out some of our other amazing hangouts with amazing women from around the world, please do that. And uh, for now, have a lovely rest of your day, guys.